my son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the reformers, to be a reformer, among the Huguenots, to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists, to be a Calvinist, among other Protestants, generally, to be a Protestant, and obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits and to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope, and even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews, that, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences, and enjoying the blessings of peace, to take sides with the combatants, and to act secretly with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side but openly opposed to that with which you might be connected, only that the church might be the gainer in the end, in the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duty as a spy to gather all statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliaments and legislatures, and the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as coadjutor, confessor and priest, but you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola, in, this, in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner as directed by your superiors for none can command here who has not consecrated his labors with the blood of the heretic for without the shedding of blood no man can be saved therefore to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure you will in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. <clears throat> I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding I am dispensed with to assume my religion heretical for the propaganda of Mother Church, for the propaganda of Mother Church's interest to keep secret and private all her agents, counsels from time to time, as they may entrust me and not to divulge, directly or indirectly, by word, writing or circumstance, whatever, but to execute all that shall be proposed, given in charge or discovered unto me by you, my ghostly father, or any of this sacred covenant. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion of my opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. 
that I may go to any part of the world whithersoever I may be sent to the frozen regions of the north, the burning sands of the desert of Africa, or the jungles of India, to the centers of civilization of Europe, or to the wild haunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things whatsoever communicated to me. I'm reading to you from the authorized version of the scriptures. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures and turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures to Matthew chapter 5. Please follow me along, word for word, verse by verse, at the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Follow me along, check me out. Follow me along, make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Follow me along, make sure I'm telling you the truth. Check me out. Get your authorized version of the scriptures and follow me along. Okay? Where's the love at? Where's the love at? A lot of people today, because of Christianity, because the Jesuit order has infiltrated Christianity and has destroyed it, Okay? That's why I'm not a Christian. I am not a Christian. I'm not a Christian. I'm of the Church of God or the Church of the Living God. Okay? But a lot of people construe love with not telling lost people, not making lost people aware of their sins or their need of a Savior. But they do love them into the kingdom. We're not building a kingdom today. We're not building a kingdom today. Okay? And most people, when it comes to this Christian love thing, they always come to, they seem to come to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, which is part of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. And when you read the Sermon on the Mount, like we have talked about before, faith is mentioned only one time in the Sermon on the Mount. Why? Because the Sermon on the, on the Mount is doctrine that is applicable for the Kingdom of Heaven. The Kingdom of Heaven, when our Lord Jesus Christ is on the earth ruling and reigning from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Okay? That is what the Sermon on the Mount is doctrine for. Because when you read the Sermon on the Mount, it's all works. It's all works. And during uh, the kingdom of heaven, you're going to be able to see Jesus Christ on the throne in the kingdom of heaven, which uh, is after the seven-year time period of the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, So faith is not needed during the kingdom of heaven. Why is that? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, just one verse. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. One verse, one verse, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hmm. So what... What do you need faith for when you are going to be able to see our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, sitting on the throne in Jerusalem? Faith is not needed when you can see him. Okay, But see, a lot of people, and like I said, the thing about, well, where's the love? I was sent an email uh, about the previous video um, rebuking the lost devil, the Jesuit coadjutor, David Wood. Okay, David Wood is a lost man. Okay, he is not saved. Okay, but uh, so an individual peaceably asked, well, well, is that how you show love to people? Hmm. David Wood mocks God, mocks his word. 
David Wood is a Jesuit coadjutor. Trained by Jesuits at Fordham University. He is also a Calvinist. He, he preaches the Trinity. You watch his video that he did on the Trinity. Uh, uh, you know, one plus one plus one equals one. It's madness. It's foolishness. It's stupidity. Okay, David Wood is not a saved man. But this individual asked me, it's like, well, where's the love at? What, how, is this how you show love to people? Now, this individual didn't give any scripture verses, but what he was basing, what you were basing your question off of, was in Matthew chapter 5. And this is the byproduct of Christianity today in their phallus houses, church buildings. Love. Let's preach the love of God. Don't, don't judge people. We're not judging you. Don't, med, don't tell the sinner of his sin. Don't make him aware of his need of a Savior because he is a sinner on his way to hell. No. Love him and God loves you. And they base this off of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 on to the close of the chapter. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Whatsoever shall, and whosoever shall, and Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. Hmm. So the homeless individual who asks you for $20 and you give it to him, and he uses that to buy booze, um, cigarettes, or drugs. Hmm. Hmm. But that's showing love. Let's continue. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Mm. Now see, people want to take this and apply this for doctrine today. That this is, you know, we are to love our enemies. How do you love your enemy today? We've talked about this before. You love your enemy today by telling him the truth of Scripture. By how you adhere your life to living according to the gospel found within Scripture for us today in this dispensation. Okay? But what about this? Turn now to verses 21 and 26 within Matthew chapter 5. you got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. The Sermon on the Mount is doctrinally not for us today within this dispensation. Doctrine, how one is made right within this, the current dispensation, whichever you are in. Okay, Instruction and in righteousness weighs on how we can follow God within that dispensation for according to his righteousness. Okay, Doctrine and instruction and righteousness are two different things. Doctrine is how one is made right with God within that dispensation. Instruction and in righteousness is how to live godly within that dispensation. Okay? Not doctrinally. Two different things. Instruction and in righteousness, absolutely. What we looked at thus far is our instruction and in righteousness, absolutely. Doctrinally. Not for us today. Prove it to you. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 under verse 26. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, 
And whosoever shall and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, the Bibles remove without a cause. Your NIV, your ESV, your New American Standard, they remove without a cause. So that if anyone is angry, they're in sin. But didn't Jesus get angry when he kicked people out of the temple? Yes, he did. Jesus got angry. He had righteous indignation. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Okay? But see, the Bibles, and this is the scriptures, okay? The Bibles take out without a cause, making Jesus a sinner. The Bibles also in Isaiah chapter 14 um, say that Jesus was cast out of heaven. Okay? But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Check this out. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, this is important to note because during the kingdom of heaven, the law will be there again. Not, um, not offering uh, sacrifices for sins because Jesus Christ has already paid the price for sin in his death, death, burial, and resurrection, okay? But thank offering and giving of thanks and certain things like that. The law is going to be there again during the kingdom of heaven, okay? Leave there, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Now, verse 23 under verse 26 is critical here. Why? Because number one, it shows us that there are going to be offerings being made during the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because the law is going to be reinstituted. Not for, um, uh, the, uh, for sin offerings and stuff, because like I said, Jesus Christ already paid the sin once and for all. Okay, but thank offerings and stuff like that, and trespass offerings and stuff like that, and uh, you know that kind of stuff. Not uh, you know, and I, I know a trespass offering is for sin, but the law is going to be there during the kingdom of heaven. But look at this, verse twenty-five: Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge. There's one lawgiver and one judge, right? Right, Christian? Right? There's one judge. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. See, the problem is, in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, I believe it is. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 11 on to verse 13. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. David Wood, in that video of his, I, I do not know if he has publicly repented of that. Okay? I do not know. Okay? I understand that was done a long time ago, but there again, I do not know if he has publicly repented of that. He had ought to because he openly mocks God. He wears something that he wears something that pertains unto a woman on in that video, and he boasts about it. Okay? And he boasts about it. He mocks God. But see, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So, because judgment isn't executed right away, it's like, well, hey. I'm getting away with it. David Wood, he's getting away with what he does. Okay? 
fulfilling the goals of his Jesuit masters and leading people to hell and making the faith that was once delivered unto the saints abhorrent unto the lost. Okay? He's, he's fulfilling the will of his Jesuit masters quite well. But let's keep reading here. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. See, today, it is appointed on to men once to die, and then after that, the judgment. Okay? So, because judgment against an uh, evil work isn't executed speedily, therefore people think, hey, I can get away with it. Now, nothing's happening to me. I can do it. Now, you know, hey! But see, during the kingdom of heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be on the throne. You don't need faith when you can go and see him, okay? So, what does that mean? What does that mean? That means that judgment against an evil work is going to be executed a lot more rapido, speedily. These people are going to, you're going to have to answer to the Lord himself personally a lot more quicker than today okay so so go back to matthew chapter 5 verse 25 agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way lest at any time the adversary the adversary deliver thee to the judge who is the judge our lord jesus christ who will be physically pres present on earth on the throne ruling and reigning at jerusalem so when someone is in sin or does a trespass like this they're going to have to go stand before god our father personally in jerusalem see okay they're going to have to give an account to him personally Okay. Okay, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. All right? Keep that in mind. And the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Okay? So see, during the kingdom of heaven, our Lord talks about this, okay? Ye have heard that it had, in verse 38, it has said, had been said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Why is he saying these things? Because during the kingdom of heaven, if someone doesn't walk according to the doctrine, which is found here in the, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, according to the law, um, they're going to have to give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ personally. So this is why... He says in verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Why? Because those that curse you during the kingdom of heaven are going to have to give an account to themselves of themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ personally a lot more quicker than today. Okay? So this is why our Lord Jesus Christ said this in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? Doctrinally, dear friend, Doctrinally, this does not apply for us. Okay? Instruction and in righteousness, absolutely. But doctrinally, doctrinally. And see also, too, from verses 45, 44 on to verse 45, is where people come up with pacifism. Uh, not def uh, no self defense. Like if you're a husband, or father, and someone breaks into your house to rape your wife or to kill your children, that you're not supposed to defend them or defend yourself? No. Depraved indifference is sin, dear friend. Depraved indifference is sin. Okay? Be aware of that. Be aware of that. So, for you to base what you have, you know, where, why aren't you showing them love? Like the love that's talked about in Matthew chapter 5, that's not written for us today. It's written for another dispensation. But to instruct us in righteousness, now what does apply for us today? you got to rightly, uh, rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. got to rightly divide the word of truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 9 on to verse 14. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. 
For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Be reviled, we bless. How do you bless someone who is, being, who is reviling you? More on that in a minute. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscurring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Now go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 on to verse 24. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. This is take two of this video. The first take, I had the window open. My lost, wicked, next-door neighbor uh, came and said, I can't stand hearing your husband screaming about God. <laughs> For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it, if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. See, Christ came here and fulfilled the law. He was doing what was right according to Scripture. He was fulfilling the law. Okay? Okay? So, number uh, verse 22, Who did no sin, he didn't sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, because he was harmless, undefiled, fulfilling the law. But yet Jesus got angry, and he called the, uh, the Pharisees uh, vipers. He called Herod a fox, an insult, okay? Yes, he did. Yes, he did, because he had righteous indignation. He had a cause, okay? But when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Why? Because he was a lamb brought to his shears before the slaughter. Okay? Fulfilling scripture. Fulfilling prophecy. Fulfilling the law. Okay? When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. When you suffer as the church of the living God for adhering to the scriptures, you got to trust on the Lord. Just as our Lord gave example as he did. Okay? Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray. But are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Because you got to remember 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay. Second Corinthians, come on, fingers work with me. Second Corinthians chapter five. One verse to start, verse eleven. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The terror of the Lord. That everyone is going to have to give an account of himself before God. Saved at the judgment seat of Christ, lost at the great white throne of judgment. Okay, everything that Paul did was in the fear of of the Lord. People like to say uh, Paul never preached the fear of God. Yes, he did. Everything he did was in the fear of the Lord. Okay, and the fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Uh, Job twenty eight twenty eight. Okay, but knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Was David Wood actually uh, showing the terror of the Lord when he was sitting there wearing a dress, hmm? putting lipstick on his face, boasting of his tattoos? Hmm? Uh, 
as a comment in the previous video, well, that was old and a long time ago. Yes, but he, I'm not aware of him ever repenting of it. And he is okay with people uh, putting that sermon uh, on his, uh, on his, on that one channel or whatnot. Okay. David would never repented of that. He boasts of it. He mocks God. Okay. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Oh. What does that mean? Let's continue. Reading verses 17 now on to verse 21. Familiar verses. But I was asked about this. Here's the answer. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We are all in the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, we are ambassadors for Christ, having the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. You show love to your enemies by telling them, making them aware of their sin according to Scripture and giving them the gospel. And unfortunately, most people will not hear the time has come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and turn away their ears from the truth and be turned on the fables, okay? We are seeing the fulfillment of that today, right now, as we speak. Okay, so usually what happens is by the way you conduct yourself, the way you live your daily life according to the scriptures, that is an effective witness also, as we have already looked at in First uh, Peter chapter 2. Okay, we commit ourselves unto the Lord and walk according to the scriptures. Okay. Because, like I said, well, if the Lord opens the door and you have an opportunity to witness uh, through the scriptures, praise the Lord, jump on that. Like, okay, Lord, lead me, guide me, okay? But, unfortunately, most people don't want to hear the truth. They get offended. So, it's how you live your life according to the doctrine of Scripture found for us today, and also in other things found in the Old Testament, for all things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, instruction and in righteousness, okay? Okay? All right? We show love to those who hate us by living a godly life as according to the Scriptures, abstaining from all appearance from evil, Departing from evil and fearing the Lord. Okay? Witnessing to them the gospel of Jesus Christ through the scripture. Making them aware. It's like, uh, hey, hey, you want to show love to your enemy who hates you, who would kill you, who would run you over and bludgeon you to death with a baseball bat? You want to show love to your enemy? Uh, hey, man, you believe in a false gospel and another Jesus. Okay? You're going for a cliff. You, 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 need, to, you need to repent of that. Turn from it. Okay? That's how you show love to an enemy. You want to hate your enemy? God loves you. God's not mad at you. God's not judging you. You don't warn them of their sin. That's hatred. Okay? True love is to speak the truth of Scripture. That's how you love your enemy today. In the dispensation of the kingdom of heaven... It's different because the judge is going to be on the earth and they're going to have to give an account personally. Muy, muy rápido. Unlike today where you're going to give an account when you die, whether at the judgment seat or at the great white throne. Okay? All right, do you see? Do you see? Okay? We love our enemies today 
by living godly according to the scriptures. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. And sharing with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. The truth of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believeth. Unto the Jew first. And also to the Greek. Okay. That, dear friend, is how we show love today. And Paul also, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 on to verse 17. But thou hast known, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Unless you, you compromise a little and do as the world, be as the world to win the world. God loves you, yeah. Or unless you're an outright jerk, okay. But all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Like David Wood is, a deceiver, working for the Jesuits, a Jesuit coadjutor. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And, the, and that from a child Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good. And also, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 on to verse 16. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Not saving yourself as though you're working to stay saved, but that you are living by a godly example. Okay? Alright? That's how we show love to the lost. By giving them scripture. How we behave godly in this dispensation. Okay, it's, it's Romans chapter 12, dear friend. It's Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Who are you proving it to? Yourself? Or to those to whom the Lord will send you as a witness unto? Okay? And you know, you, got, you also got to remember this. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Okay? Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verses 17 and 18. Uh, let's read verses 16 on to verse 18. In Acts chapter 17. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. When he saw the city holy, given to idolatry. His spirit was stirred. So what did he do? When he saw, wow, 
everybody is given to idolatry here. What did he do? Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Disputed. Uh, hey, hey, th th see all this? This is, this is heresy. This is evil. He didn't say, like, God loves you. No, what did he do? He saw the city given to idolatry. So what did he do? He went to them. It's like, oh, hey, hey, uh, all this, this is heresy. This is idolatry. This is leading you to hell. He showed love to them by telling them the truth. This is evil. Okay? Verse 18. Then certain philosophers, philosophers, oh, philosophers, hmm. philosophers, huh? Uh, Colossians chapter 2, <laughs> verse 8, <laughs> beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, Jesuits, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And David Wood has a degree in philosophy from Jesuit Fordham University. And he belongs to this group of Christian philosophers. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, back to Acts chapter 17, uh, verse 18 again. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preacheth, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So see, his spirit was stirred. These guys are all lost. So what did he do? He went and disputed. Uh, hey, hey, guys, uh, you're, you're worshiping devils. This stuff will send you to hell. He showed love to his enemies, to those who were without. How? By telling them, to, uh, by preaching unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Okay? That's how you show love unto someone today. Right? And where's the love at? In the Old Testament. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 19. And I, to you who sent me that email, I, uh, who I'm being cordial and polite to because like, um, I believe he came peaceably. Okay? There were a couple things that were worded in his sentence and his email, but Overall, you know, I'm not going to treat him as some, an enemy of Christ. But Second Chronicles chapter 19, verses 1 on to verse 2. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Love them that hate the Lord. And then, of course, in Psalm 139, which we have talked about in great length before, okay? Psalm 139, okay? <clears throat> oh, uh, verses 19 on to verse 24. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. Now David would openly would not say that he hates God, but he professed that he knows God, but in works he denies him. By wearing a dress and giving off the idea that for a Christian it's okay for them to do so, and doesn't publicly repent of that? David Wood, dear friends, hates God. He is a Jesuit coadjutor. 
He preaches the Trinity, which is a doctrine of devils, which is a doctrine of Satan. David Wood is not a saved man. He is not my brother. He is an enemy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to hate the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ with perfect hatred. If they hate our Lord Jesus Christ, we are to hate them with perfect hatred. We are to abhor that which is evil and to cleave to that which is good. A lot of you have a problem with that. Okay? I know you do. But that is the fact for today. Okay? Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. If they're an enemy of my Lord Jesus Christ, they're my enemy. They hate the Lord. Okay, you get it? We are to hate them with perfect hatred. They hate the Lord. They are our enemies. Okay? We are to hate what God hates and love what God loves. That is perfect hatred. Perfect hatred is not justifying hatred because of something of your own personal thing. No. And that's, many people run into that. No. We are to cleave to that which is good and abhor that which is evil. Okay? David Wood is our enemy, Church of the Living God. He is not a saved man. He is not a saved man. Okay? And like I said, this Nordic guy whose video will be in the description box, a lost guy who plays video games, a video gamer, has more discernment than a Christian to discern that David Wood is not what he says he is. He's an infiltrator. He's a Jesuit coadjutor working for the Vatican. He is not saved. Are we to love someone who openly mocks God? Are we to love that man? <laughs> David Wood, he is being warned. He has been warned, I'm sure. And he knows the truth. Someone who is as deceptive as David Wood is has to know what the true gospel is in order to pervert it the way he does. Don't forget that, dear friends. Don't forget that. Okay? All right? Do not forget that. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 29 on to verse 32. We're supposed to forgive one another of the church of the living God. Who is my brother? Okay? Who is my brother? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 on to verse 32. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. See, today in this dispensation, when the Lord saves you, you are sealed. Once saved, always saved with the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that Spirit. God our Father, one God, dwells within you. Okay? You are sealed with the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that Spirit. Alright? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Okay? Unless you come to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of the Lord, call upon his name, um, you're not saved. You have to come to the Lord on his terms. And he save you by his grace through your faith. Okay? When you come to him on his terms, broken of your self-righteousness, godly sorrow, it's your fault, and in fear of the Lord, you call upon the name of the Lord, and may he save you. Okay? Hence, he forgives you. He forgives your trespasses. He forgives your sins. The blood of Jesus Christ, uh, his son, washeth away all our sins. Hence, your brethren of the church of the living God, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So we are not to hate one another of the church of the living God. We might not like one another. Okay, which unfortunately happens. Okay, Paul and Barnabas, okay? 
two saved men who had a vehement disagreement and they parted uh, asunder, okay? They probably did not like one another because of that. But they were brethren and loved one another because they, they had the same Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. We as brethren, there are many people out there who are of the Church of the Living God who I do not like, but I love them because they are my brethren. There are many out there of the Church of the Living God who don't like me, but they love me because I am their brother. You see how that works? The love here is in context to those who are saved, born again, converted of the Church of the Living God. Okay? And uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. God's love, dear friend, is not for some Christ-rejecting lost sinner who spits on the Word of God, who denies the Word of God, who mocks the Word of God. God's love is not for him. You hear the true gospel one time and reject it. You are a child of wrath. God's wrath is for you. God's love is not for you. God's love is Calvary, the cross. And you have to go there on his terms. You don't boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way. That's a thief and a robber. Okay? But Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 on to verse 14. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. For those who are saved. Okay? In salvation, there's no distinction today. Culturally, there's a difference. Salvifically, no distinction. Okay? Today, in this dispensation, got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Now, this is not Calvinism. Calvinism, which elect and non-elect. No, elect. The elected way of the cross. That is what that means. The elect. We who are saved today, saints unto God today, are the elect. How? We went the way that he elected. The way of the cross. That's what that means. John Calvin teaches elect and non-elect. People are going to heaven no matter what they do. They have no, no anything in the matter. And they have these over here, non-elect, going to hell without any say in the matter whatsoever. Elect and non-elect. That's heresy. Hence, David Wood is also a Calvinist. Go figure. Okay? Go figure. So he's Jesuit trained and a Calvinist. And making the faith that was once delivered unto the saints look abhorrent unto Muslims and unto lost people in general. Yeah. Fulfilling the will of his Jesuit masters, man. Let's continue. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, who have gone hit to the uh, gone the way of the cross, the way God has chosen, not someone who boots the door out of the way and goes up some other way, okay? Holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, suffering yes forbearing one another who is the one another and forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any even as Christ forgave you so also do ye now say if any man have a quarrel against any context even as Christ forgave you um, you have to go to the cross you have to go to Lord Jesus Christ according uh, to his terms in order for him to save you. You don't one day all of a sudden say, okay, I'm, believe, I, I'm saved. Why? Because I just believe. It doesn't work that way. Okay? It doesn't work that way. Okay? Um, you're saved if you go to the Lord on his terms and he saved you by his grace and you answer his grace through your faith. Okay? Okay? Who's the one who does the saving? <laughs> okay? So, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Um, lost people? You lost people? 
you easy believism heretics who skip over scriptural repentance, um, you're not saved. You're not saved. Okay? You're not forgiven. You're lost. You didn't come to the Lord on his terms. You're not forgiven. You're not forgiven. God's forgiveness is there to be had, but you have to go on his terms according to his ways. Not your own, dear friend. Okay? Do you understand? So, context again is within the church of the living God. But what does this have to do with those who are without? Okay? And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Mm, charity. Charity. Here's another thing that a lot of people get confused. Go back to Matthew chapter 6. Got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 on to verse 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So see, Christianity teaches that you've got to forgive other people or you're not forgiven today. Is that the case for today? No, it isn't. No, it is not, my dear friend. No, it is not. Because, okay, look at that. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. That's a work. Your forgiveness is based upon you forgiving someone else. But today we are saved by His grace through our faith. Hey, you easy believism heretics that say that prayer is a work? Would, would you not? This is a work. Is it not? Is it not? In order to get God's forgiveness, you have to forgive someone else. That's a work, Jack. And notice, that's within the... Sermon on the Mount, which is for the kingdom of heaven, doctrinally not applicable for us today. So see, in the kingdom of heaven, which is all works, if you don't forgive someone, you're not going to be forgiven. Is that the way it is for today? No. No, it isn't. See, you come to the Lord on his terms. You are sealed. Once saved, always saved. Absolute truth. Seal. Sealed unto the day of redemption. And we already read about grieving the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay? Today, whether or not you forgive so-and-so doesn't mean anything to your salvation. If you, why you would want to do this, I don't know. If you, as the church of the living God, are not going to forgive so-and-so, that's not going to cost you your salvation. But what happens, though, when you do not forgive someone? Okay? It's not a requirement for today, for your salvation, as it will be during the kingdom of heaven. If you don't forgive someone during the kingdom of heaven, you will not be forgiven. Plain as day. But for today, again, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Verse 31, let all bitterness. When you don't forgive someone, that fills you with what? Bitterness. And wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking. Be put away from you with all malice. So see... Though you not forgiving someone is not a requirement for salvation today. You, for some reason, why I don't know why, but if you are saved, born again, and you choose to hold a grudge, that's not going to cost you your salvation. But what's that going to do? That's going to fill you with bitterness, with wrath and anger and clamor. Hence, hence, as we already looked at, you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So, if you are going to hold a grudge against someone and not forgive them, your testimony is going to be shot. It's going to make you bitter. Your walk is going to be all fouled up. You're not going to lose your salvation because your salvation is not dependent upon whether or not you forgive someone today within this dispensation. But see, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. Okay? 
You don't have to forgive someone today. You don't. But see what happens when you don't. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. Okay? So it is in the interest of Christ as his ambassador to forgive other people. But is, it, is your salvation dependent upon it as it is in Matthew chapter 6 for the kingdom of heaven? No. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. But see, if you don't forgive someone, it's going to knot you up inside and you're going to drag the name of our Lord Jesus Christ through the mud. Okay? We are to abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Absolutely. Amen, amen, hallelujah. But remember, when you hear Christians from the church building, from the phallus house, tell you, you got to forgive other people or, or, else your God, or else God won't forgive you. Hmm. So what they're preaching is these people who openly um, blaspheme God, who openly mock God like David Wood does, we're supposed to love them by not uh, judging him because he's in sin and mocking God? But just say God loves you. As the church of the living God, you ought to forgive other people because the way you serve Christ reflects Christ. Okay, remember that. Okay? But that is not a requirement for your salvation today, as it will be during the time of Jesus' trouble. Okay? Because remember, go to Matthew chapter 18. Okay? Got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. It's not okay for you as a saved man or woman, a brother or sister, to hold a grudge because that's going to eat up your insides. You're going to be filled with bitterness, wrath, clamor, and all that stuff. Yes, you are. And you're going to make the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to look foolish to the lost because you are holding on to a peevish little grudge. Don't justify it, but you've got to let that go. Because remember, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. The Lord will repay eventually, dear brethren. Okay? And during the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 on to verse 20. Moreover, if thy brother, who is my brother, shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and he alone, him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man or a publican. You don't hate him, but just like, okay, brother, you, you've done this to me, okay? We, we have this problem. You're not going to hear... I've, I've come to you, we've talked about it, but you're not going to... I love you, but i got to separate myself from you. I, I can't be with you. I'm going to go this way, you go this way. Okay? Okay? Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And we got a video on the channel here where we go over this uh, specifically. Not going to get into it in this video. Verse 19. Again I say unto you, that if two or of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Verse 19, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. And verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And see, Christians will say like, well, see, you got to keep the gathering of yourselves together in a church building because when you're gathered together, there Christ is in the midst. Um. But today, if you are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you are sealed with that, with the Holy Ghost. Uh, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And the Lord has that spirit. You have God living within you. 
So where two or three together are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. But today, if you are saved, you have God living within you. What is this talking about? This is for the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven, where faith is not a factor. You don't need faith when you're going to be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne. And you're going to go to him to be judged of him when you don't do the works that are required during the kingdom of heaven. Do you see? Do you see? And again, you can read here in Matthew chapter 18, while we're here, verses 23 on to verse 35. Okay? There is, therefore, is the kingdom of heaven. Our Lord telling you about what this, he is telling you about what it pertains unto. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. Okay, and note here, 10,000 talents. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. This is talking about what? The kingdom of heaven. It tells you so in verse 23. This is in context for the kingdom of heaven. Not for today. Instruction and righteousness? Yes. Doctrine? Well, no. Let's continue. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And notice a hundred pence. Far less than the, what was that? Um, where was that? 10,000 talents? Now put that in perspective. God who is long-suffering will have all men, Mr. Calvin, to be saved. Okay? God who is long-suffering, putting up with the antics of the Jesuits, hoping that all, wanting all men to come to repentance and to be saved. Okay? God has more right to be indignant and angry than any of us at our best have a right to be angry. What, we have the right to be indignant and peevish about things and God does not? The contrast. We owe a debt unto the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, that we can never pay. But see, when we come to him on his terms, broken of our self-righteousness, you're not a good person. Okay? Contrite, it's your fault that he died. And in fear of him, you call upon his name and he save you. Okay? Yes, by grace through faith. Okay? Bravo, bravo. But see, we can't pay that debt. We have to come to him on his terms. So, when we get overly angry over someone who steps on our toes, and not like, hey, forget about it. Hey, you done me wrong, but you know what? I'm going to let it go. Okay? You see the comparison there? Far less. You're going to get angry at someone for far less than what the Lord has every right to be angry at you for? And even though you have a right to be angry, who has more right to be angry, dear friend? And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Remember what we already looked at in Matthew chapter 5? So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord, the judge, all that was done. Do you get it? Then his Lord, after that he had called him, called him, very quick, muy rapido, okay? Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desiredest me. 
Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. And this is in context for what? Verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. It's for the kingdom of heaven, not for today. So see, when it's all works, your forgiveness depends on whether or not you forgive someone else. Works. Today, you don't have to forgive someone. Why you wouldn't want to? Why? Because you, you are an ambassador for Christ. That's going to wreck your testimony. Your fruit is going to be rotten. You're going to be bitter. Uh, why you wouldn't want to? And Why you want to hold on to a grudge? I don't know. But see, that doesn't affect your salvation. It affects everything else, but not your salvation. Okay? Okay? Remember that, dear friends. Remember that. And also, too, um, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Uh, Jesus got angry. Jesus also called Herod a fox. Calling someone a fox, the little foxes, was quite an insult. To call someone a fox in the times of Scripture, that was quite an insult. Coming from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Oh, you brood of vipers. Okay? Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 on to verse 13. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And also, I believe it's in the uh, Gospel of John, he makes a scourge of small cords and whips them out of there. Do you think he was all cheerful and runny gushy when he did this? No, he was angry. Righteous indignation. Fulfilling the law, which he was which he came here to do, to fulfill the law, see. Okay? Jesus got angry. Paul got angry. Peter got angry. We are to abhor that which is evil and to cleave to that which is good. And Christianity makes everything gray. Okay? You are to hate the evil and love the good, my friend. You are to hate abortion. And you are to hate every false way. That's Psalm 119. You are to hate every false way. I hate Catholicism, but I don't hate the Catholic person, spirit's own body. I hate Calvinism but I don't hate the Calvinists. Okay? I hate the charismatic movement, but I don't hate the charismatics. Okay? We are to hate every false way. But Christianity. That's why I'm not a Christian, dear friend. And see, you basing your premise off of what you find in the Sermon on the Mount no, no, my dear friend. No, 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 my dear friend. Now, now I want to turn this in a different direction about ignorance. There are those, see, Christians today are not taught the true God of the scriptures. They're taught, love them into the kingdom. Don't judge people. Don't uh, love them. Show them love. Don't tell the sinner of their sin. Don't make the sinner aware of their sin. That's hate. That's not love. Okay? That's hatred, not true love. All right? So many Christians today are ignorant. They do not know better. I mean, Christians today are not taught rightly dividing the word of truth. They're not. They're not. And if you would rightly divide the word of truth, a whole lot of your problems 
would clear up. But go to Jude. Jude. 17 on the verse 24. Jude 17 on the verse 24. On the verse 25, excuse me. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, esoteric, separate themselves, sensual, led by their senses, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference. The Philippian jailer, he was going to kill himself. Worldly sorrow brings death. Um, if it was worldly sorrow, the Philippian jailer would have succeeded. Okay? All right? But see, the Philippian jailer, he was ready to kill himself. Okay? He had godly sorrow. He heard the testimony of them singing hymns. He saw the testimony of Paul and Silas being beaten. But yet they were singing sim, uh, hymns on the God and heard them <laughs> like my neighbor did and said, I'm sick of it. I can't stand it. Yeah. No. Okay? But of some have compassion, making a difference. When you come across someone who is truly broken of themselves, not just sorry because they've lost this, that, or the other thing, but realize, I, there's nothing good in me. No, not one, not, not one thing. I'm not righteous. I can't save myself. Okay? That's when you preach unto them the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're, they're broken. Okay? Repentance like with the Philippian jailer. Why didn't Paul say, are you aware you're not a good person? Why? The Philippian jailer was already in a broken state. Okay? And others save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Scare the hell out of them. Take the sword of the spirit and cut them. Be a little rough with them. Smack them upside the head with the scriptures. Hit them hard. Scare the hell out of them. Unless you repent of your sins. Okay? You can't repent of your sins. You can't repent of your sins. You couldn't do that at gunpoint. What are you repenting of? Unless you repent of yourself. Your self-righteousness. Unless you repent of yourself. This belief that you're a good person. Unless you repent of yourself. And repent of those things. Unless you repent of yourself. And come to God broken of your self-righteousness. It's your fault that he died. You put him on that cross. And unless, and, fear, and unless you have the fear of the Lord and call upon his name, unless you turn from these things, unless you turn from your self-righteousness, you're going to burn, you're going to go to hell, and you have every right to, to, to go to hell, and you deserve to go where you're going. Some save with fear. Okay? Forgive me for saying that about me, because you can't repent of your sins. Even if you were held at gunpoint, you can't repent of your sins. What are you repenting of? You are repenting of your self-righteousness. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. You're not a good person. The scriptures has your number check. Okay? So, someone who is already broken, you don't need to preach to them repentance like the Philippian jailer. But someone who is not broken, save with fear. Oh, like Shimon the sorcerer, who believed, who was baptized, but yet asked Peter to pray for him. He wasn't broken. He was in the gall of bitterness because he lost his position. You see? Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless from before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. And now... Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 
Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, cha charity, peace, with them that call on the name, with them that call on the Lord, excuse me. Let me reread that verse again. Flee also youthful lusts. Want to get even, huh? Got to settle the score. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. It's not up to you to get even. Flee also, youth, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience. Now see, the Christians come to verse 24 and gentle. It's like, don't scare them. Love them. No, that's, that's not what the gentle is talking about. The gentle is talking about not taking the whole of Scripture onto a babe or to a lost person and jamming it down their throat. I am guilty of that. Little by little. Here a little, there a little. Line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept. You give them little morsels at the first. You don't cram a sermon down their throat at the beginning when you're in witnessing to people through the scriptures outside your door. Okay? Little by little. That's the gentleness that is, that is being described there. Not this sissy little, oh, don't scare them. Don't tell them. Don't warn them about the cliff that they're going to fall off of if they keep running. Okay? Don't warn them. No. Show them love. That's hatred. Not warning them. Not warning the sinner of his ways. That's hatred. That's not the gentleness that Paul's talking about. Gentle. Don't overbear. Don't overload them. Don't, you know, because I've done this. Where you will go too far and give them way too much at, at the beginning. And they go deer in the headlights. Kind of like how Mark the Messenger looks when in his videos. With that deer in the headlights look, nothing there. You've lost the moment. Because you've overdid it. That's the gentle. Gentle unto all men. Not right away. Telling someone that they're going to go to hell unless they repent of their self-righteousness, that's, that's, yeah, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty um, cutting for most lost people. <coughs> I mean, it is. Okay? Gentle. Not everything all at once. Okay? In meekness, okay, check this out. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, who are ignorant, who are their own worst enemy. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Verse 25 is talking about someone who doesn't know better. Most you Christians... Most of you, you have no idea what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. Why? Because you're not taught that in your church building. Okay? Okay? They don't know. They hear about it. Okay, so now you know. You're no longer ignorant. Being ignorant in and of itself is not a bad thing. Okay? I have been ignorant about many, other, many things. And then I was as informed. I was not ignorant. Ignorance is not knowing. Okay? So, this is talking about ignorance. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, or are taken captive by him at his will. Question. Is David Wood ignorant of the truth? David Wood, the smug, arrogant, egotistical philosopher, um, he knows exactly what it says in the book of Deuteronomy about how a man shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a woman. He knows right well. He's not ignorant. Not ignorant. Okay? He's not ignorant. Therefore, his damnation is just. Because he willfully mocks God. Okay? And also, while we're on this, okay, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 
2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 on to verse 9. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Uh, uh, since judgment against the spirit, uh, ju since judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Yeah, and saying, "Where is the promise of his coming?" For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved into fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. God is the eternal. God has no beginning or end. In light of eternity, what is a thousand years? That's what that means. Okay. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing, Mr. Calvin, that all any should perish, but that all, except those who are elect or non-elect, uh, no, but that all should come to repentance. Calvin. <laughs> but look at this. Look at this. Verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Willingly. Purposely don't want to know the truth. See, you can be ignorant because, hey, I just, I, I just didn't know better. Okay, uh, I, I just didn't know. Now I know. Now I'm no longer ignorant. Same the thing with tattoos. You're lost. You get a tattoo. The, God, the Lord saves you. It's like, oh wow, I wasn't supposed to be a ta get a tattoo. I didn't know. Now you know. You're forgiven, but now you know. You're no longer ignorant. But see, what do you do now that you are no longer ignorant? Hmm? In Acts chapter two. What did they do when they were pricked in the heart? A little prick. Just a little prick. What did they do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? It's like, we, 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 what, what do we do? Acts chapter 7. When they were cut to the heart by what Stephen said to them, what did they do? Oh, they stopped their ears, gnashed on him with their teeth, and they stoned him to death. Is David, is David Wood ignorant? No, dear friend. David Wood knows exactly what he was doing. And he is an enemy of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, who openly mocks God. And makes the faith that was once delivered unto the saints look abhorrent to anyone who would be inquiring. Okay? All right? Now, go back to Jude. Go back to Jude. Guys, coadjutors like, uh, like David Wood, again, Jude, chapter, uh, Jude, Jude doesn't have chapters. Jude 12 on to verse 13. These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Yeah. And of course, go to Second Peter, chapter two. Second Peter, chapter two, verses twelve on to verse nineteen. But these, as natural brute beasts, unregenerate, they only got a head knowledge, like David Wood does. Okay? And if you were to call him on it, he would rub in your face his Jesuit education. Okay? But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not. 
and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that counted pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart have they, on heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought into bondage. Hmm. Interesting. And going back to Jude, okay? Going back to Jude, verses 14, now... On to verse uh, 16. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have uh, have spoken against him. Going to give an account. During the kingdom of heaven, going to be a lot quicker. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And see, Dear brethren, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verses 3 and verse 8. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Oh, Mr. David Wood, uh, just watch his videos, man. Uh, he really thinks he is something. Sure does. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Self-examination. Okay? Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Be, not. be not deceived. God is not mocked. David Wood mocked God in that one video with the dress. He has not, to my knowledge, publicly repented of it. Or condemned it, okay? And people, and he's aware of what's going on with his stuff on YouTube. People who have uploaded that stuff on that Acts 17 apology. It's the, the, at the, at least the recording of this, the newest video. He's boasting of it. He's, uh, he's mocking God. And what does it mean to mock? Okay? You've heard of a mock uh, military exercise? Fake, not real. Mock, make fun of. To joke, okay? To poke fun at? David Wood mocks God, saying that it's okay for Christians to wear a dress, to put lipstick on, and to show that, hey, I'm a Christian. See, I got tattoos. It's okay. You're saved if you were saved, yes, but don't go around boasting them. Don't do that. Okay? All right? 
And now go to and now go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. See, guys like David Wood and the guys that follow and support him, they're all highly intellectual. It's all up here. It's not down here. They have a head knowledge. They don't have a knowledge that goes down to the heart. It's all up here for them. And you question them on it. Absolutely. Proverbs 14, verses 6 on to verse 9. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth not. Wisdom is the fear of the Lord, and to depart from evil is understanding. Job 28, 28. Live by it. Okay? But knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth, understandeth the parting from evil. Go from the presence of a foolish man who says in his heart, There is no God, when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. But yet you see guys like David Wood using these technical, big sounding words of men. But that's not the wisdom of God. Okay? The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. And David Wood in that video that the Lord had me to do, which was a reaction video, you could say, it was very impromptu, he was mocking God. He was making a mock of sin. Oh, well, it wasn't for Christians. Yeah, it was for, uh, where he was witnessing onto Muslims wearing a dress. Dude, come on. Come on. Okay? Now go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Verses 30 on to verse 34. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men, Mr. Calvin, everywhere to repent. Calvinism, again, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed among the which was Dionysus the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. See, the resurrection of the dead. Some mocked. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, guy rose from the dead. Yeah. Which Muslims do? Which Muslims do? Mm -hmm. But see, at the time of the ignorance, not knowing who God truly is, he winked at. Wasn't okay with it. Until what? Until... Today, this day, when Jew and Gentile, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Greek is a Gentile, anyone can be saved. But you have to come to God on his terms, not your own, dear friend. Okay? And people like David Wood, who openly make a mockery of God, he's fulfilling the, the, uh, the deeds of his Jesuit masters. How? I'm making the faith that was once delivered onto the faith look abhorrent, which he doesn't represent anyway. Okay, it's all in his head to him. Okay, and one more stop in Jude. Jude 4. Jude 4. Jude 4. Jude 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, what David Wood did in that video was telling Muslims that it's okay for Christians to wear that which pertains unto a woman, even though within the scripture it is condemned. And then these Christians will suddenly become dispensational. Well, that was for the Old Testament. Testament. Well, okay, find me within the Pauline epistles, anywhere in the New Testament, where that's okay. That it's okay for us today to, work, to be in drag. It's not there. Hence, it's still binding. Okay? Nice try, though. It's funny. Christians will 
suddenly become dispensational for a moment in order to defend their sin. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their ma imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. David Wood. Just what educated. Verses 29 on to verse 32 in Romans chapter 3. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Now let's read verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Like I said, this video done by this Nordic guy, I, I forget what his channel name is. I'll put the, uh, I'll put the video in the, description, in the description box. I don't support him, but um, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. David Wood, the fruit of David Wood. What is his fruit? Apparently, if he gets a uh, Muslim to turn away from Islam, uh, they become atheists, right? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. David Wood is not a safe man. He is not our brother. He is lost. And he is on his way to hell. And he's damning many people to hell along with him, dear friends. Okay? Now go to Romans chapter 3. Verses 3 on to verse 8. This is what David Wood was portraying on his, in his video onto Muslims. That was over three years ago or four years ago. Romans chapter 3. Verses 3 on to verse 8. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a, speak as, as a man. I speak as a man. But if what I'm doing makes God look good and it's a lie and it's sin, why am I... God forbid. For how, then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more bonded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, and not, and not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, Whose damnation is just. Mm. Whose damnation is just. Let us do evil that good may come. So dress and drag. Uh, doing evil that good may come. So dress and drag to prove a point that you have the grace to do that today. Preach the Trinity using that sex symbol. Where's the love at? For David Wood, I have no love. I have no love for him. He is a lost man. He has made his choice. I believe David Wood has gone past the point of no return. Okay? You hear his testimony too? About, you know, it was all up here. No true brokenness. Okay? No true brokenness. <laughs> okay? And Romans chapter 6 now? This is basically what he was portraying, even though he didn't verbally say it. Romans chapter 6, verse 15. 
What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. See, it's okay, according to him, in the lights of James White, Jesuit James White, for Christians today to get tattoos, it's okay. It's not a sin. It's the Old Testament. It's okay if a Christian today, God's grace covers it all, to wear a dress and be in drag. Verse 16 in Romans chapter 6. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, the servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Servants, not slaves. Okay? See, you got to remember, brethren. You got to remember. People like David Wood. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 on to verse 8. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. See, apologetics is all about answering every objection given to them. That is based off of people perverting the scripture where Peter says, let every man give a reason for the hope that is in him. But the apologist says, let us give a reason to every man who asks us a question. Okay? And apologists like Ravi Zacharias, who's dead and in hell, okay? What do they do? They use philosophy, the wisdom of men, the tradition of men to do their arguments. Uh, David Wood, like that video where that he did uh, talking about the satanic trinity, he didn't even use a Bible, let alone the scripture. Okay? But one plus one plus one equals. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The Spirit that's in David Wood is not the Holy Ghost, I can tell you that. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor yet of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And skip across to the page here, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 on to verse 29. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of his world, of this world? See, guys like David Wood and those who follow him, um, they're, all, they're all about, they're highly intellectual. They're esoteric because their minds set them apart. They have not the spirit. Kind of like Mary Baker Eddy, uh, Messiah is mind to them. It's all up here for David Wood. There's no true conversion. Okay? How could someone do what he did and still allow it to be promoted hmm? and not publicly repent of it? Hey, in the description box or in the comment section, if David Wood openly repented of him doing that skit he did of how many years ago where he wore a dress, okay then. But to my knowledge, he never did. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not. And by, by the way, he's Jesuit educated. He's a Jesuit coadjutor. Okay? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness, foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, called, not Calvinism, called meaning the way of the cross, the way that Jesus Christ, God our Father, chose. You go His way, according to His terms. 
The called way, the way of the cross. That's what that means. That does not mean elect and non-elect. Okay? You go the way to the, the cross on his terms, broken, contrite, and fear of him, call upon his name. You don't boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way. You go that way, you are the called in this dispensation, both of Jews and Greeks. Okay? Okay? Called. The way God chose, the way of the cross. That's what that means. Okay? <clears throat> but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Guys like John MacArthur, uh, what's that guy, um, Justin Peters, Paul Washer, Ray Comfort, David Wood, all these guys, they're, they're all about their intellect. They, they speak man's words exegesis and all this stuff. They boast of their Jesuit educations. Well, not everyone went to a Jesuit university, but all the universities are controlled by the Jesuits. Okay? Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Why? Because they're after the flesh. Okay? Not many. Doesn't mean that not many wise, noble, or mighty. But those who are wise, noble, or mighty, what can happen? They can be puffed up in their, their wisdom, their might, their wealth. That's why But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That no flesh should glory in his presence. And when you got guys like David Wood Glorying in his flesh. Not a saved man. And I beg your pardon. But you're a fool if you defend him. Now, go back to Second Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 on to verse 15. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Spiritual. God the Father dwelling within you, uh, the Lord, you know, and the Holy Ghost is that spirit. With spiritual, the authorized version of the scriptures, not a Bible. Okay? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have known the mind of Christ. You as the church of the living God, you have to judge. Uh, the whole Sermon on the Mount, you know, uh, chapter 7, Judge not, that ye be not judged. It's all about judgment. But see, people say, don't judge to defend their sins. Don't judge me. Don't make them aware of their sins, which is exactly what Christianity preaches today. You need to judge. You are expected to judge differently. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Clearly in sin, ew, 
okay, that has not been undone within the New Testament, okay, having uh, a man having his stepmother, clearly condemned in the Old Testament, which is not undone in the New Testament, okay, sin. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Puffed up. We're not judging you. This is when you need to be in church, when you're in such grotesque sin. We're not judging. Look, we're Christians. We're not going to judge you for that. God loves you. That's exactly what they were doing in verse 2 here. That's exactly what, where's the love at for David Wood, who openly mocks God? But see, dear friend, that email you sent me, this is what your attitude is. And you're basing that off of Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, which is not applicable for us today, doctrinally within this dispensation. But this is what you are doing. Don't we're not judging you. Don't judge him. No, this is when he needs our love and compassion, right? What does Paul say to this? For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have been judged already? Well, that's the Apostle Paul. So only the Apostle Paul was the judge and not we ourselves according to Scripture? Come on, man. Come on now. As though I were present, concerning him that hath, done, hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Kick him out! Have no fellowship with him! Get, it's like, hey, whoa, dude, you're in sin, okay? Look, th see, here, this is, you're, you need to, you need to, you're not going to repent? Get away from me, man. Go, go away. Go away. Hand them over to the destruction of the flesh. What does that mean? Someone who is saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God can get messed up in sin. And if it gets too bad, the destruction of the flesh, meaning God will kill them. Okay? Okay, you got a brother who is truly saved, messed up in sin, won't take correction, but continue on in it? Dude, get away from me. Kick him out. Get away. Go. And hopefully it's not too bad that the Lord has to kill him to quit him from doing such. Remember, we're ambassadors for Christ. The way you serve Christ reflects him. You remember? Remember? Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Look, we're Christians. We're not judging. That, that, that's not good. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators. Yet, not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. We are in the world, we are not of the world. These people we are to be a witness unto. Okay? By word, the scriptures, and by deed, how we live our lives according to the scriptures. Okay? We are his ambassadors, having the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. Okay? We are to be witnesses out there. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay? But now I have written unto you not to keep company if a man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. If someone is called a brother and does all these things, God loves you, you're, we're not just, no, judge them. It's like, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? 
but them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. It's all about judgment. you got to judge, dear friend. Like I said, people who, you know, with Mark the Messenger and now David Wood, don't judge him. They're in sin. They're teaching heresy. They're both lost. I have a perfect standard, the authorized version of the scripture. I am supposed to judge them according to the standard. Yes, not hypocritically. Judge myself first. Yes, not hypocritical judgment. But we are to judge, dear brethren. Okay? And see what was happening in Corinthia in the Corinthian church, the, the body, not the building. We're not judging. They were allowing sin and not judging sin. And dear friend who sent me that email, that's exactly what you were doing. But rather judging me because I spoke up about what the sin and the evil that David uh, Wood did. And calling him to an account to it. But of course, he's, he's highly intellectual. And so are all the people who follow him. They're highly intellectual. Esoteric. Better than anyone else. So, are we to love those who hate the Lord? You might say, well, David Wood doesn't hate the Lord. Yes, he does. He doesn't preach the true Jesus Christ. He's a Calvinist. He openly mocks the Lord and his word. And he also preaches the Trinity by boasting that the female matrix on that one video with the two eggs and you can figure it out himself. He's not a saved man. He's Jesuit trained. He's not a saved man. That is going to be it for this video. Hopefully, if this video makes it, uh, I think it will. I think it will. But um, that's uh, going to be it for this video. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. This will be the last video that I will be doing about Mr. David Wood. Okay? I'm going to put, the, you, you will see that thing in the beginning. Where, which is the uh, Jesuit Extreme Oath. Okay? That's going to be it for uh, uh, talking about David Wood. Got better things to do. Got bigger fish to fry. So, thank you for watching this if you do. Uh, thank you to those of you who pray for us, who help us. We love you. Thank you very much. We're going to get this video uploaded and... Um, Hopefully you talked to some brethren today. Hopefully this answered your question, dear friend. And to you who sent me that email, I'm not, I'm not attacking you. If you want to still talk, um, fine. Fine. I'm all, I'm all for it. But uh, you need to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. And hopefully this video has answered some of your questions. Okay? Watch out for David Wood. Stay away from him. Thank you. See you in the next video.